He is, though. Um, will you join me in welcoming Pastor Bill Headley? <laughs> Woohoo! Wonderful, 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 wonderful. Good morning, everybody. Hey, it's really great to be back over here. It's been a long time, and so when Pastor Mike uh, gave me this opportunity, I absolutely jumped at it. It's great to see some familiar faces. It's wonderful to see new faces. Um, just real quick, before we get into the message, uh, at the Chisago campus, we're doing great. Um, we have two services right now. We have a 4.30 Saturday afternoon service, and we have a 9.30 a.m. Sunday morning service. And uh, we're looking at adding a third service uh, just because we're growing. We're filling our, our services, and so it's just going to become a necessity. Um, I, I want to invite you guys to come, if you haven't, and just check out our church. The reason being is because you might know people that live in the Chisago or Lindstrom or Center City or Schaefer area. And what I would love is for all of you at the Forest Lake campus to come and see that um, it's a great little church that we have going there. We have a great kids program, the nursery. We have a great worship leader. Uh, we have a halfway decent preacher. I mean, the, the services are... <laughs> It's a legit service, that's what I'm trying to say. And I think that if you were able to come and visit, it gives you that much more confidence to invite somebody to visit the Chisago campus of Maranatha. And so I do want to invite you to come and check us out. Um, we're going to get right to it. Grab a Bible, grab your phones, grab your iPads or your notebook, whatever you read in, and turn it in that device or in your Bible to the book of Matthew. At the Chisago campus, one of the things that we are doing is we are, um, the series we're in, if you would call it that, is just going through the book of Matthew. We started this January of 2018. Yep, you're right. It's been over a year and a half, and we've just been going through the book of Matthew. And I've got to be honest with you, I absolutely love doing this. There's so many things that the Lord has opened up for us. There's been great messages. If you're curious about them, I do want to invite you to go to our website. Um, it is different than the Forest Lake Campus website. The address is maranathashisago.church. Maranathashisago.church. It's a great little website. Our past sermons are on there, and it just kind of gives you a flavor. It gives you an idea of who we are, and um, I think there's some good stuff on there. Matthew chapter 14. This is where we are in the series of the book of Matthew at the Chisago campus. And, and, and just in thinking about coming here and sharing a message, I just thought, well, why not just keep going in our series and just talk about it here? And, and it's so amazing listening to our missionary guests because this message lines up so wonderfully with the message that you guys shared and, and with the words that you brought. In Matthew chapter 14, starting in verse 13... What I like to do is read a chunk of scripture and then I want to go back through and break it down and have four points and just see what the Lord has for us today in it. And so in Matthew chapter 14, starting in verse 13, let's read. It says this, when Jesus heard what had happened and what he's talking about is when he had heard about the death of John the Baptist. It says he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them, and he healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said, and he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. And then he gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up twelve baskets fulls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. 
And we're going to stop right there. And, and, and what I want to do right now is I want to look at this and, and out of this pull out four very clear points. And so if you happen to be a note taker like my mom, my mom comes to the Chisago campus, my mom and dad do, and, and after the service I asked my mom, well, you know, so how was it? Just wondering, was it clear? Yep, I was able to take good, clear notes. So now my goal is for my mom to be able to take good, clear notes. So if you're a note taker, I hope you're able to get these four points. If not, let my mom know, and I'll hear about it. The first thing that I think that, that's important for us to talk about or that we see in this scripture is a problem arises or a situation arises. The problem or the situation is there's a lot of people, the day's getting on and there's no food for them. And they're going to have to eat. If you're anything like me, if you don't eat, it gets a little dicey. They got, obviously, they had thousands of people there that were hungry that they needed to take care of. That's the problem. And they recognized this problem. You guys, there is a situation that we have today. Turn in your Bibles, if you will. You're already at Matthew 14. I want to ask you to go back to Matthew 13. And I want to read you a really quick parable. The problem, the truth, the situation that we have today is that people need to know Jesus. They need to know Jesus. And sometimes I think that we take this a little too lightly and we forget the seriousness of the statement that I just made. People need to know Jesus. In, in, in this parable, in Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse 47, I want to read this to you. It says this, Jesus is speaking and he's, he's giving this illustration. He's showing the people this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. He says, once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore, and then they sat down, and they collected the good fish in baskets, but they, but they threw the bad away. Okay? Good picture for us, right? Now listen to what Jesus says next, because this is where it gets serious. You, you guys... If you've never heard me preach, I love to have fun. I do. I like to laugh. I like to be silly. But when I read something like this, it's like, hold on a second here. And this is a burden that I think God laid on my heart from a month ago or so when we went through this. This is serious. Because here's what Jesus says next. He says, this is how it will be at the end of the age. He says, the angels will come and they will separate the wicked from the righteous and they will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, I don't know about you, but that's serious to me. Because what Jesus is saying is just like Todd, if me and you, me and you were to go fishing, We'd catch some fish, we'd get a basket full of all kinds, and we'd take the carp and we'd throw them in some farmer's field because we don't know what to do with them to make them taste good. We'd take the crappies, the 12 to 14 inch crappies especially, <laughs> and some of you guys right now, I just lost you because there's a little bubble going up from your mind going, ice fishing. We'd take those 12 to 14 inch perfect fillets and we'd, we'd treasure them. But the bad ones we'd throw away. This is the picture that Jesus gives us of eternity. There is a day where he's going to take all of the fish in the net. That's all of us. And he's going to take the wicked and he's going to throw them into the fiery furnace for eternity. And he's going to take the righteous. And they are going to spend eternity with him. That, my friends, is a serious thing. Sometimes we come and go from church, not just this church, not just the church I get to be a part of, but every church. And we forget the seriousness of this right here. We're not talking about a week-long bad time in hell. We're not talking about a month or a year or 90 years. We are talking about all of eternity. That's serious. That's the situation 
The disciples bring to Jesus the situation. There's all these people and there's no food. Friends, we have a situation. The second thing that I would ask you to write down is this, is Jesus' response to the situation. He says, you do it. He says to the disciples as they bring to him this situation, he says, okay, I, I see this. The disciples want to say, well, let them go fend for themselves. Let them take care of it. And, and I, this just hit me. All too often in the church, we want to say, well, too bad for them. Let them worry about it. Let them take care of it. What does Jesus say in response to the disciples? He says, you do it. And friends, I want to tell you something today. As we talk about the situation and the seriousness with which we look at the gospel, the truth, and if you're here, I hope you believe what the Bible says because it's real. And when Jesus says there's going to be a separating, it's real. It's a serious thing. And he says this, I believe, to me and you about the situation we find ourselves in. He says, you do it. Do you know what God's heart is? Is that everybody would spend eternity with him. Amen? Don't turn there, but write this down maybe. But 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, it says that God desires that none should perish. It doesn't matter what language you speak, what color you are, where you live, what you drive, none of that. God desires that none should perish. And you see, we have the answer because I think a great question that comes out of that parable of the net would be this. If we have the righteous here and the wicked here, my question, John, would be, how do I get to be the righteous? Amen? Because I don't want to be a bad fish. I want to be a stinky fish. So how do we get on that righteous side? The Bible is so clear. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. He says, this salvation, this is a gift for you. You have been saved by grace through faith. It's only through faith that we're saved, friends. It's not by the works we do, the money we give, the scripture we memorize, how many songs we can sing. We are saved by one thing, and that is by grace. And so we have this message, this truth, to, to front, confront this situation. We have the answer. And Jesus is saying, I want you to do it. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 and 14, to sum it up, Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. Go and let it shine. I want you to do it. Coming back to the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus says to his disciples, and if you're here and you say that you are a follower of Jesus, guess what that makes you? A disciple. So guess what he's saying? He's saying, you do it. You, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Go and tell people about Jesus, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I've said. You do it. You show them the answer. You bring them the truth. You tell them about me. You tell them they're saved only by my grace. I want you to do this. Turn in, in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Or in your phones, it's kind of quiet. Don't, don't not turn. Don't get bored. Turn. Second Corinthians chapter five. I said at our church one time, I wish there was an app you could get that made the sound of pages turning. <laughs> because there's something really cool about hearing twenty, thirty people turn pages, knowing they're turning in the Bible. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse seventeen through twenty-one says this. It says, therefore, and the Apostle Paul is writing, he says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, and the new is here. Now, now listen, he goes on. He says this, all this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, if you have your Bibles, I want you to underline that and highlight it and maybe somehow reprint it in italics and do it because that's, a, that's the power right there. God is reconciling us to him through Jesus simply by faith. Are you with me? 
Simply by faith in Jesus, we are reconciled to God because of our faith in who he is. Praise God, that's beautiful, isn't it? Man, I, I don't know about you, but I'm a sinner. I deserve hell, and I get to be spending eternity with Jesus only because of my faith. That's beautiful. But it doesn't stop there. What Paul says is now I'm giving you this message of reconciliation. You do it. He goes on. He says this, We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. What appeal is God making? The appeal he's making is, Come back to me. Turn to me. Repent from this sinful life and come back to me. And here, I'm going to give you the, the way to do it, which is Jesus, my son. Why? Because I want to spend eternity, not just with you, but with everybody. Remember, 2 Peter 3, 9, God desires that none should perish that none should perish. He goes on and he says this, we are, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. And he says, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You see, church, we see the issue. People need to know Jesus. Why? Because if they don't, they're going to spend eternity in hell. Jesus is the only way that we are saved. That's it. Romans chapter 10, 13. Many of us have Romans 10, 13 memorized because it's part of the Romans road, right? If you, you've learned that in different classes, Romans road and these different Roman scriptures that can bring somebody to this place of repentance and, and giving their life to the Lord. Well, this Romans 10, 13 is part of that. Romans 10, 13 it says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Hallelujah, that's wonderful. Amen. But let's not stop reading there. Because then he goes on. And it says, how can they believe if they don't hear? And how can they hear if nobody talks about it? You see, we know how we're saved is simply through faith in Jesus. And we know the message. We know the problem, the situation. And Jesus is saying to me and you, then you do it. So now in verse 17, though, we see the disciples, and I think their response, quite honestly, comes up to be pretty similar to the response that you and, ha you and I have a lot of times. You see, the response that the disciples say is this, is, well, that'd be great, but this is a really, really big problem. <laughs> I mean, look at all of these people. And imagine this now, if you will, these disciples. These are just a group of guys. Don't forget that. Don't ever forget that. The disciples that walked with Jesus and that from that day on changed the world forever. They're just a group of ordinary people. That's it. There's nothing special about them. They're just guys. And so here's this group of guys, and they're saying, these people are going to get hungry, and they're going to be looking at us to solve the problem. Jesus, what are we going to do? Jesus says, you do it. Uh, how are we going to do it? All we have are a few loaves. That's all we have, loaves. By the way, I'm going to throw some of these. This is totally different than a baseball game where people are diving for it. You guys get out of the way. <laughs> We're going to go deep. Adam, this is going to hurt my arm, by the way. My, my age. Did I make it? Oh, look at that. That was... Oh, pretty close. Here's the deal. The disciples do what we do. Because I know what some of you are thinking. When I said the words, you do it. I know what you're thinking because I think the exact same thing. But I only have. But this is all I bring. But this is what I've done. But these are my struggles. But I don't have much money. We bring to him our reason why we can't just like the disciples did they say but i only have five loaves 
This is all I have. And you guys, here's the thing. This is, as I'm praying and, and just in worshiping, coming into this message, you know my prayer today is this. It's that someone in this room who has counted themselves out would be willing to put themselves back in. That somebody who thinks they can't bring enough to the table would be willing to do. Is that somebody who thinks they're not good enough or that their past is too bad would be willing to throw their hat back in the ring. There's a story of a pastor that's in Rochester right now, and I watched a little bit of his testimony over the years, and and this pastor was in prison for a period of time. He was in prison, legit in prison. He committed the crime that put him in prison, and now he's the pastor of a large, growing, evangelical, AG, Pentecostal church. And he's making a huge difference. Now I know as I look out there, some of you have been in prison. Bob Dolliger. I think Sandy had her arm around him until that moment. <laughs> She's like, say what? Some of you have been in prison, but you weren't behind bars in a cell. Your prison is maybe like mine, and it included drugs and alcohol. Some of you, like me, are divorced. Some of you are remarried. Some of you have kids out of wedlock. Some of you, your life is not the mirror image of Jesus. But I want to tell you something, that there's nobody in the Bible whose life is except Jesus. And this is the part that I get the most passionate and fired up about because this is an army in this room right here. This right here is a world-changing group of people. Jesus had 12, and they were no different than you are. And and we still talk about them 2,000 years later. And we count ourselves out. Yet we know the seriousness of the situation. People die every day. We just heard of another one this morning. They die and step off into eternity where they will spend heaven or hell. And many of us believe it, many of us are saved by it, but we count ourselves out from being used with the problem. And today I think Jesus is telling his church in these times with which we live, you do it. He knows our past, he knows our lifestyle, And he's saying, you do it. You guys, I want you to think back of all of our Bible heroes. Think of Jonah. What's Jonah most known for? Running from God and getting to spend three days in a whale. Maybe getting's not the best word, but... (laughs) That's what he's most known for. But again, finish the story. Paul Harvey, what's the rest of the story? The rest of the story is that God gives him another chance, and because he says yes to the second chance, an entire large city repents. It's called Nineveh. And today, some of you are Jonah. When you were 16 at junior high camp, and I don't know, Justin, where you're sitting, but Justin's taken some kids to camp. And some of you young people that are going to camp, you're going to hear God say, here's what I want you to do. Some of you old people like me in the room, when you were at camp, you heard God say, this is what I want you to do, but you ran from it. And today I hope you're willing to say, like Jonah, okay, God, I'll go. Because I'm going to tell you what, there's people that need you to say, I'll do it. You guys, we have missionaries here. There's too many people who count themselves out because they can't write a $1,000 check. They count themselves out because they can't write a $100 check or a $50 check. But here's what I want to tell you. Your $5 can change their world, which can change the community they're ministering in. Because if everyone in this room gave $5, that's a huge change. Every little bit helps. And that brings me to my my fourth point. Verse 18, Jesus, he, he, he responds. He gives us the answer. 
to what we're struggling with. And you guys, the struggle is real, young and old alike. Peter, the struggle is real, that we feel like we don't have enough, like we feel like we can't bring it. We've failed. We've... Here's the deal. It's not about what we have. Church, listen to me today. It's not about what we have. It's not about how much we have. It's, it's all about what are we willing to do with what we have. Because Jesus gives the answer right there when he says, okay, you have five loaves. They're all spread around the room. He says this, just bring it to me. Bring the little you have to me. This represents the little that we have. And some of you with a past like mine, no, it's not. This is the little that we bring. And the thing that makes the biggest difference is what we do with it. When we choose to bring the little we have to God, you go ahead and throw this up there. When we choose to bring the little that we have to God, everything changes. I'm going to wait till they get this figured out because I want you guys to see the fruit of what happens when we bring the little we have to God. You see, when they bring it, what Jesus does is he takes the five loaves, he takes the little, and he, he makes it enough to change their world. This little bit that I poured in here, you're going to watch this over the next couple minutes, and it's going to be overflowing out of this cup. You see, that's the idea that we have to have with Jesus. We have to change our focus from what does what I have do into what can God do with what I have? Amen? Amen? So you see, surrendering what we have is what makes all the difference. Taking your $5 and saying, I'm willing to give this changes somebody's world. Taking your ability to sing and stepping in front and, and singing, it changes somebody's world. Taking your ability, listen to me, to, you're, you're a plumber in the room, or an electrician, a carpenter. You take this ability that God has given you and you say, God, I don't have much because I can't preach like Pastor Mike can. I can't sing like Todd can. I can't do these things. All I can do is figure out where this two by four goes and it looks great, I can build a house. If you're willing to say, God, I will bring to you my ability to pound nails and cut wood and make things straight, God will say, I will use that. Last year, there's a group that went to Florida on a mission trip. And they went down and they helped with churches that were affected by a hurricane. And I've heard testimony after testimony of how God brought these different gifted people to change somebody's world because they were willing to bring what they had. An electrician using his gifts at just the perfect time. Somebody that had all this knowledge about windows where everybody else is like, oh man, now what are we going to do? Says, that's no problem. A plumber, a roofer, Things that we don't think make a difference. All of a sudden, when we say, God, here's the little that I have, I bring it to you. We take a little, and it turns into a lot. You see, the early disciples, it wasn't about them. It was about who they were with and who they surrendered to. In Acts chapter 4, verse 13, the, the theme scripture of Witness Messiah. The people took note of the early disciples and everything they were doing because they were ordinary people doing extraordinary things. That's us. Now here's the thing. I, I want to ask you this question. 
Today, for some of you, you might be in a position where you have to come back to God. I want to tell you something. It doesn't happen because of your works. It doesn't happen because of your money. It doesn't happen because of your scriptural memorization. None of it. Those are great discipleship things. But you want to come back to the Lord? It happens simply by faith. If you're here today and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus, what's stopping you? Right where you're at, you can say, Jesus, I, just simply through faith, I know where I want to spend eternity, and I believe. Maybe you've been a Christian for a long time, and you're like Jonah. Early on, you felt these things, but then your life looks like mine, filled with 27 years of bad choices. Then just come back. You see, Jesus tells us very clearly, I want you to do it. We have the message. The choice is, and the question is, is what are we going to do with it? You guys, would you stand with me for a minute? As we consider the situation, we have to realize this is serious. If you come to church just to check it off your list of things to do, I hope maybe your eyes are open to that. Wait a minute. Hey, this, this isn't just ink on paper. This is real. That day is coming. You guys, the situation is serious. I hope maybe today that the eyes are open, that you understand, hey, we, we have something to bring to the table. We don't have all the answers. We don't have the million dollars. We have the answer. And maybe we have five dollars. Are you willing to bring what you have and put it in the hands of the one who can work miracles? You guys, let us never, ever lose sight of the power of God. We hear of these amazing miracles that take place. The greatest miracle of all is salvation. And that's something that we can bring to people. Would you join with me today? And to say, God, I want to bring the little that I have to the table. I want to bring my peace, my five loaves, my two fishes. And say, God, do with it what you will. Use me as you will, and I will do my very best every day to say yes. Father, right now, we thank you so much for the salvation that so many of us have confidence in. Father, we thank you that you loved us enough to send your son to die for us, and that it is simply by faith, not by anything that we can do, but it is simply by faith that we can be saved. Father, we ask that you would help us. Help us to have compassion just like you did on those that are lost. God, help us to allow our busy lives to be interrupted for the sake of somebody's eternity. Would you give us the courage to bring the little we have, to bring our failures to bring our ugly pasts to the table to simply say, God, this is all I have. Would you use it? And then God, on Monday, 
and on Tuesday and on Thursday and Friday, would you give us the ability, the strength to say yes to you every day? May it not be a one-time decision or choice, but an everyday commitment to bring what we have to the table. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your spirit and for your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys, it's such a treat to get to spend this morning with you. I'm sure that there would be people up here that would love to pray with you. If you just want to pray with somebody and offer what you have to the Lord, they will join you. Have a wonderful rest of your Sunday afternoon. God bless you all. Go love somebody today. You are dismissed.